Welcome to the Mom Owned and Operated Podcast, the podcast about moms and for moms, where we have candid conversations about running a business, raising a family, and remembering ourselves. I'm your host, Rita Suzanne, a single mom of four, digital strategist, and provider of no-nonsense business strategies and tactics. Hi, this is Rita Suzanne, and today I have my guest, Marion, with me. Marion, I'm so excited to have you on so we can talk more about you, your family, and your business. So please tell us all the things. Right. Thank you for having me. My name is Marion Ninchi, and I'm the founder and CEO of You Are Advocate Worthy. I'm a mom and a wife. Um, my kids, I have three kids. Um, one is five, seven and three. So it's busy over here. And, you know, it's, it's nonstop, never a dull moment, actually. <laughs> so I, um, my business is You Are Advocate Worthy, as I mentioned before, where we help parents learn how to advocate for their children by enhancing the quality of their health care and education. And I was inspired by this because, um, my own experience as a special needs mom's mom helped me to see a lot more behind the scenes of a, you know what other special needs parents go through. And so when I couldn't find the answers that I was looking for, um, and actually from the people that were supposed to help me, I was frustrated and, and stressed out. So over time, um, I met other special needs parents and I realized that they were not like aware of a lot of resources their children could benefit from. And I felt determined to look for ways to change that narrative. And I want with this coaching business, I want to help parents transform their mindset and know that they have a right to be heard and obtain, you know, to attain the resources their child needs. And that's what you are advocate worthy. Like that's why it was born because I want to create a safe space for parents to learn how to advocate advocate for their child with confidence and not back down in the creeds. Yeah. And as I mentioned to you and um, how most people know, my youngest son has epilepsy and he um, needed an IEP. And so I was, you know, I didn't really know anything about how to do any of that or, or even like advocating for his care. Um, In one instance, he, his epilepsy just started out of nowhere. There's no rhyme, no reason. And for two years, it was just Medicaid, Medicaid, Medicaid. They did a lot of testing, but then all of a sudden they wanted to do a, um, a brain surgery. And it was more like exploratory, like, yeah, we're going to get in there, see what's going on. We'll put some, you know, lump, these uh, things on there and, and then, um, and then test it out. And, and I was just absolutely, I was like, absolutely not. And the first, the feeling that I had was like, I was the bad guy because that's the way they make you feel. So can you tell us right. more about like your experiences, like even going through the IEP experience was, challenging because you know it's a it's a hassle for the education system yeah so when my son he was two years old when I noticed that he wasn't speaking as much as other kids um actually I didn't I didn't realize it at that point but the first time he said mommy was not nine months and he didn't say it again and so I didn't realize that was an issue, you know, um, because I was a first time mom and I didn't know a lot of things that I know now, but I w- went to his doctor and asked for a referral and she referred me to an early intervention program. And my husband, we were able to check, um, choose the agency that best fit his need, my son's needs. Um, and so when it came time for him to transition, when he aged out of that and he was transitioning into the, um, school, um, I was, again, by myself. You know, my husband was working. I was a stay-at-home mom. I had a daughter who was in the NICU. And so dealing with that and then having my son who needed extra help, it was it was very overwhelming. So I, when I was sitting in the IEP meetings, I would just go ahead and go along with... At first, actually, to be honest, I felt so devastated that they said he had a language delay. Yes. Um, even though I knew he was being helped through the early intervention, but for them to evaluate him 
and then have all this data and then just say he needs this. It, it was very overwhelming and devastating because now I have another kid that has special needs and I never saw that for myself ever. And so once they told me all of that, I just let them tell me what he needed, what goal, tell them the goals. I did not know I had a lot of rights. I mean, I didn't have time to read the parents' rights. Like, you know, it was so much going on. So um, as time went on, when it when it comes to the IEP, I found out that I can hire an advocate to help me. So I need, even though I'm advocating for my son, I needed a reinforcement to help me understand a lot of things um, that I didn't know. Um, and so I was able, she gave me a consultation and she told me like, these are just basic goals. Like, he could be doing so much more. And so once she helped me, he, the, it, and she, and I, I wanted to say this too. A lot of people think that advocates are very like um, confrontational and everything, but she was very, very collaborative with the teachers. And she helped me realize that we, and I didn't know this either when I first started, but the, te- the team is there for the child. Of course, I knew that because that's my child, but the everybody's goal should be to take make sure that my son is okay so we're supposed to be on a team to help him so that's what my um advocate helped me to see and she and because we were on that mindset we went into the meetings with less tension <laughs> and the teachers were more willing to help they listened more they respected my my wishes um because we were in constant communication anyway with the teachers and um, coming in with, you know, a lot, I hear a lot of people complaining that the teachers did this, 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 and, you know, knowing your rights helps a lot and showing that you're prepared helps tremendous, tremendously. Um, and so once I did, once I hired someone and they helped me, we may, we were able to create goals that would benefit my son and for him to progress well. And he is, he has done so well. I I honestly think that he, I don't, I don't know what would happen if I didn't, didn't hire someone to help me, but I'm, I'm noticing that he's progressing at a faster rate, especially during the pandemic. Like a lot of kids are behind because, you know, everything just stopped and I was scared that he'd regress, but he did way better than I thought he would. And now he's on his way to reading um, past his grade level, and he, he loves to have chats with us. And he is like he's a deep thinker, and he's only seven years old, <laughs> you know. And he keeps us on our on our toes. He's still just getting the help he needs, but more so for reading. And he loves math, and you know. So I'm I'm grateful that my husband and I took the steps we needed when he when we noticed that. And I forgot to mention that he did call me mommy at the age of three, yeah, that was after he started his services and he hasn't stopped calling me mom since. Of course not, mom, no. mom, mommy, That's mommy. <laughs> different variations, everything. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so. That's, that, it's so interesting. I did not know that you could hire an advocate as a go-between. I went through all of the, um, the meetings with my son's team. And, and I will say that they did a very good job trying to collaborate all everything together and asked me what were the goals for him and my son, even though he has epilepsy, he has um, a type of epilepsy. So every time he has a seizure, he regresses some, so he can remember something today, have a seizure, and then it would um, kind of be hard for him to remember it after that. So that makes his learning especially challenging sometimes. Um, and even when um, he was younger, I noticed that he had kind of a speech, I, I wouldn't say impediment, but there were there were some signs of speech delay. Like there were some words that he had a trouble saying And also he wasn't enunciating. And so people would have a hard time understanding him, but I understood him. So I didn't think it was a thing until he was in first grade. And they were like, "Um, yeah, he needs some kind of intervention. So the school was the one who actually brought that uh, to my attention. And that was before he even had a seizure. Uh, But the speech thing was there. I just didn't 
I just thought, you know, like he was my youngest. I thought I kind of thought like it was kind of cute and endearing, right? <laughs> like, yeah, I, and I and sometimes you're in denial too. Like sometimes you like, oh, um, certain like um certain families are like, oh, we don't have that in our family, you know. So that's that it kind of does the child a disservice, but um, but at the same time too, because you understood him, you didn't think anything of it as well, but I'm glad you listened to the teachers because you, you see how it's, it's helped him a lot, right? Yeah, it definitely helped him. And then as he's, you know, gotten first, he started with the, um, what's the other one, the, not the IEP, the other one, it's like, um, the lower tier one, something E. Oh, 504? The 504. Yes. Right. Yeah, he started with a 504 and that was just for testing. And then um, it was it came to our you know attention last year that he really needed the IEP and for them to then evaluate him and say that he needed to be in special classes. I when I tell you I understand what you were saying, I was devastated, right? Because in my mind, when I went to school and a kid was in like special classes, they isolated them. They, they, they kept them separate. They don't do that now, thankfully, Mm -hmm. but I just was worried about how it was going to impact like his self-esteem and other, you know, long-term, you know, problems that he may have had, but he's Mm -hmm. doing really well now. I think it depends on the school. And then once I think once they start to see that they're getting the support and the care that they need, it does help them to thrive and, you know, and be a lot better. So I'm glad that your son is, Mm -hmm. you know, is much better as well. And I love that you're helping other moms because, or even other parents, because I, you know, it's much needed. Yes, definitely. And um, as as I'm sharing a lot more of my story, um, I'm I'm receiving the same thing, hearing other people's story and from people from friends that I've had, and they're sharing their struggles too. And and I'm and it makes me kind of sad in a way, but I'm kind of happy because I I want to help and I want to be that listening ear um, because as a special needs parent, you know, a parent with a child with special needs, you don't know who's going to really understand what you're going through unless the person has been there, it has gone through it. And that's why I want to help more parents to know that there is someone that can, you, you have your family, you have your friends, but it nothing feels, you know, best. Nothing feels more great than just listening to someone who's been through it. And, and that's what I, I provide. That's what the coaching program provides. Yeah. I think that I always say like, Nobody understands what it's like to be a mom except another mom, right? And so I think that goes hand in hand with what you're offering. Nobody understands the needs of, you know, a child who is struggling like another mom who's been in a similar situation. So I think that it's super important. What do you think is um, like, what have you seen as the biggest benefit to the families that you're, that you're helping? Right. So the biggest benefit um, for the families that we're helping, they're able to have, if if at all, a weight <laughs> taken off their shoulders because they they're not spending so much time like spinning their wheels trying to find the answers, you know. And it definitely improves the family life because, like, when you're a parent, you know, you end up having to look up information, research programs, make appointments, speak with someone during the time you have to go to work or during your lunch hour. It does take a lot of your time and energy that you don't even have enough time to celebrate the small wins that your child just did. You know, like they said hi on 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 cue appropriately. And, you know, you didn't have the time to realize that, you know, and that's why I teach too to celebrate the small wins because it it just helps the overall morale of the whole family, like the whole self-esteem and everything, because we you can only do so much and your child's they're doing their best with what they're with what they have going on. And so definitely it it improves the quality family quality time, spending more time with the family. Um and with the additional help that I offer, I do most of the time consuming work, you know. So I also provide the space for the, you know, family to be the parent, mom or dad to to be vulnerable and let and I lend my listening ear when they feel like they don't really have that 
And, you know, like I mentioned before, who better to vent to than someone who's been in their shoes and learn to navigate through those feelings. So, yeah. And I think that that's super helpful because um, I don't know a lot of people who can understand, you know, the situation that I was like thrust into even um, his father, he doesn't deal, we're not together, but he doesn't deal with any of the doctor's appointments or any of that stuff. I'm the one taking him. I'm the one who's doing all the stuff. And, you know, I'll just go back to him and give him updates, but he doesn't have to really deal with any of that stuff in any of the decisions, which is, you know, it's definitely not fair. It's definitely challenging. Yeah, it definitely is stressful because even if your child didn't have the additional services, that's how life would be. Right. Much. Anyway, you know, and un- you know, unfortunately, but that's just like we're all kind of going through that same thing. So it's not really <laughs> right. We kind of have to navigate around it if that makes sense. <laughs> no, I get it. it. But it's just, you know what I mean? It's it's yeah. um, you know, it's just an added thing that I have to be responsible for. I have to be the one who's doing all of the things. And so having somebody else to talk to who I'm not educating, you know what I mean, is (laughs) definitely um, helpful. And so tell, tell us more about the actual services that you're providing, because it's is it just coaching or, or I don't want to say just, but tell us more. Okay, yeah. yeah. So we offer two programs. It's a six-week program where we do, we call it the accountability program. So we guide the, the mom or, or dad, the parent on steps to take, to start the process of obtaining like referrals for specialists, prepare for IEP meetings, um, research re- like resources that their child can benefit. And weekly, we talk about their week and discuss ways to navigate through the things that come up throughout the time that we're together. Um, The 12-week program is like do it for you. It's called, we call it the Rockstar Advocate um, Program, where we do the work for you and that it saves, saves time for the parent to, they don't have to search for too many answers. We talk about what their needs are. We follow up on referrals that they, they've been waiting on. And then we provide tools for IEP organization. Like um, like I mentioned before, when when the, t- t- when the school sees that you're prepared and you're um, on top of things, it kind of puts fire under them <laughs> to do the same. So having like all your, having an IEP binder, a notebook. So we guide you through that. We actually set it up for you and then help you to maintain the organization. And then we design a self-care plan because as parents, we tend to forget that we need rest too. (laughs) And we deserve relaxation. And even if it's just for a few minutes, like we really cater the program to each family in a way that would benefit them because every parent has different goals for their family. And we want to really respect that because, you know, it's, it's very much needed. Like, and like you mentioned, you know, it's nice to talk to somebody not having to educate them on your 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 child's condition or that your child is going through this or you're going through that. So um, just having a listening ear to someone who's been there is what we really want to put out there. I love that you're helping them with like research and you're putting all that stuff together because my question was going to be like, are you state specific, right? Because each state probably has different programs and things. And so during, for your 12 week program, you're actually researching and figuring out what is necessary for their particular area. Right. Yeah. For example, I have a client who is looking to build a community, a small community of parents that have um, special needs children um, so that they can kind of collaborate. And if somebody needs someone to watch their kid. They can they can step up and help, you know, that kind of thing. So we he signed up for a 12 week program. So that's what I'm going to be helping him do. And also looking for um, different. And he also needs someone to watch his son. And he's been trying himself. But I have a few um, ideas that I'm going to be sharing with him to see, get more information on what he needs. So we haven't gone in depth yet, but he did tell me what he needed. And so that's I'm just giving that example of something unique like in a way because a lot of people like if you're in an area where you don't you just move to that area actually so 
just to help him to gather just a few families to, you know, to help him get acclimated to the area. That's that's one of the things we do. So. I love that. And um, side note, my sister is mm-hmm. also um, was born prematurely. And so she's like 90 percent blind and she has some, um, you know, um, learning disabilities and and things as well. And so my mom cares for her. And so she, I always watch my mom go through that same process, like, you know, struggling, trying to figure out what program she could get my sister into, what she could do to help her. And even now my mom struggles with getting um, like, cause she's the primary caregiver, but she also can get a babysitter for her so that my mom can get out because my sister requires for our care. But she struggles so hard getting a babysitter to just come and watch my sister who really needs no care. She just needs an adult in the room. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and I remember when before my daughter was diagnosed with like autism, um, she had she was already she she had a she already had a global developmental delay because she was a 24 weeker and she was in NICU. She had a trick and vent. So it kind of delayed her, you know, development quite a bit. And so when I work when I was working full time, uh it was hard to find someone. It was hard to find like a a camp or something because they'd say, oh, we we um we we don't we need you to have a diagnosis. We need a it's mostly for like autism and everything. She didn't really have a concrete diagnosis. So it is beneficial to have that, to have that because then you know, you can, it's easier to find programs that cater to that specific group of children with special needs. So it is a, it is a, and when I try to find a place, they would say, they don't really want to say, we don't take care of kids. They ha- they usually just say like, um, uh, you know, we don't have anyone that's trained, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? And so, um, so that's one of the, one of the struggles a lot of parents go through too. So so and your mom did well when she like was able to find someone for your for your sister. Um, I'm sure that helped her a lot. It does. I mean, she still she struggles with it, but you know, it's mm-hmm. you know, it's it's challenging. I think at any age, regardless, you know, of yeah. the situation. And I think that um, having someone who they can lean on and help with resources, I think that that's. So important. I know that one time my son was in the hospital and um, just getting testing and so many social workers and people came down to um, like offer their services and it was so overwhelming. But at one point, I remember one of them called me and they offered that advocate um, advocating for me and Mm -hmm. they would call me every couple of weeks and say, do you need any appointments scheduled? How is he on his medicine? You know, all of Mm -hmm. these things. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so helpful, (laughs) you know? You didn't yeah. know you needed that until it was happening. Right, because I was doing it all by myself. And, right. you know, and then when I switched to his hospitals, they don't they don't do the same thing. But um the care at the other hospital is uh better for him. So, you know, but I right. love that service. And um I had another mom come to me a couple of weeks ago saying that she thought that her son was autistic. And she was like, well, I don't even really know what to do um, because he hasn't been diagnosed. And so what is, do you have any suggestions for this situation? Because um, I guess he has, uh, this little boy has signs, but she just doesn't have the confirmation. So what would you wow. tell somebody like that? Well, depending on their age, um, if they're under three years old, I think oh, he's. Three. Three. I think he's three. Okay. Okay. So he would be able to get an evaluation from the school um, that's in their district that has special ed education preschool, um, and then she would request uh, an evaluation. So that's because I. It depends on the age because there's early intervention programs that she could have signed up for, but because he's three years old, that's usually the age that they age out of. Like as soon as they're three, doesn't matter what time of year, like it's, they're out pretty much. And so there should, there's usually like a transition, um, 
uh, program um, process in which you meet with the school, you discuss when you'll have an evaluation. Um, and so the school does the evaluation to determine if the child really needs um, um, uh, like special that. education like right. services. But for, to, for her to get um, a diagnosis, she'd have to talk to her doctor to refer her to a, de a developmental pediatrician. Mm or a, a psychologist that specializes in diagnosing children with autism. Yeah, so. I I remember when I went to my son's doctor, his neurologist, and I told her that he was having problems in school and they set him up right away for an evaluation. And that's how he got recommended to the 504. So they set him up for this. I, I feel like it was a three or four, I mean, it was several hours worth of testing that they did with him to see where he was on on um, certain abilities to learn. And that's how mm -hmm. they determined and that they would recommend that he has the 504 initially to start. And then when he was still struggling, I went back to that doctor and said, he's still, he's still having problems. And he said, well, then we need to escalate it to the IEP. So I think- Did you go to the doctor or the school? Um, it was the doc, it was the doctor first. Okay. Yeah. And then so okay. once we got the paperwork from the doctor saying that they recommended this, then yeah. the school started implementing. But of course, the school wanted to do some of their own testing. Right. And, yeah, that's exactly uh, what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, because she had her diagnosis. And then when she was about to start this, when I told the school about it, they said they were going to do their own um, evaluation as well. Yeah. And so, yeah. And so and also there is a possibility I just want to give your whoever is the um looking to ha you know have an evaluation for their child. Mm -hmm. Um there's a possibility the school will determine that your kid does is not eligible. And so there's a process for that in which you can go around that. And that's what we discuss um during our, our time together during the program. We would talk about ways that we can um, get another evaluation that the school can cover the expense and then go from there. Yeah. Versus just now feeling, I guess, um, I, you know, just obviously distraught because they have no recourse and really no idea what to do next. It's like, right. Like, all the school like, all is not lost. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, says, yes. I don't need it. So that I must not need it. Right. Yeah. No, no, no. You, if you know your child better and you know what your child can, you know, what is capable of, full of and what they need help with the most. So don't, don't, um, don't just take their word for it. You know, just, you know, do have that confidence that, you know, your child and try to, you know, fight to get what they need to progress. Yeah. I feel like that with all the things, like even just trying to figure out what's going on with my son for his, uh, you know, his doctor. Uh, and I'll mm -hmm. say, you know, I'll see something about epilepsy and I'm like, well, what about this? What if, what if, can we test him for this? Can we test him for that? You know, because there has been no definitive answers. And so I'm constantly asking his doctor for more and more um, testing. And I think that if you don't have the right doctor who's not willing to, you know, do these things, then you probably should look for a new doctor. That is, you're exactly right. Because um, I love that you, you mentioned that because it's good to have good, a good communication. And, and a lot of times when we have these well visits for our child, it's, it's to track their development as well. So we want to make sure we're answering correctly and more as accurately, because if we're saying, oh, he's fine, he's fine, he's fine. And he's doing all the things we're kind of in denial when we truly need that help, the doctor's going to be like, you know, I don't think he needs the help, you know, so there is a possibility, you're, like you said, you you would have to find a different pediatrician or someone who would listen to you the most. Yeah, definitely. Because um, I think that that's an important step in advocating for yourself and for your child, you know, mm -hmm. is just really finding someone who, and it's a pain to switch doctors because I have to drive my son two hours to go to the doctor, even if it's just for a checkup for just for the neurologist, not his regular primary mm -hmm. care, but mm -hmm. two hours just to go up there. And we go up there several times a year just to get tested. Wow. So wow. Yeah. yeah, it can be such it's a definitely, You definitely have to do what you have to do to get the best care, right? Like, 
Well, you know, what happened is when we went up there and she started doing testing on him and she said, well, I don't think that he needs surgery. And, you know, I was like, me neither. So how can I make you his primary? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so yeah. I switched it and he's actually doing much better. So I'm, you That's know, really hopeful that he's going to uh, grow mm-hmm. out of this and then, you know, it'll be of his past. So if right. someone wants to um, meet with you and have a consultation, what is the best way for them to get in touch with you? Well, they can email me at hello at youareadvocateworthy.com or they can sign up for a free 60-minute clarity call at www.youareadvocateworthy.com. And they can follow me on Instagram. Same thing, youareadvocateworthy.com. You are ad, you are advocate worthy, not doc. <laughs> and um, it's okay. All the links yeah. are going to be in the, right. yeah, in the notes and everything. But mm-hmm. you know, before we go, since we talked a little bit about your um, providing self care for your clients, what are you doing, Marion, for yourself? Because I mean, three kids, a husband, and a business—you have a lot going on. Right. It is not easy. It really isn't. It does help that they're school age. I will say, (laughs) you know, um, it took me a while to get to to this place, to be honest, as far as, you know, being okay with juggling a lot, because I've I've learned to, you know, pay attention to myself and care for myself. I cannot help my daughter who has all these appointments with specialists, my sons who have IEP meetings coming up and I have to help them. I, I just make sure I do things for me. You know, I do my regular routine, but I love, I just fig- try to pick out one thing that I know I love. I love skincare. So I try to find like the, like the n- newest thing that I can try and just really enjoy that. And I love aromatherapy, like just little things. I know I don't really have time to have a spa day, even though I'd love that. But I I just know that, you know, you know, even reading a chapter out of one of the books that I'm trying to finish, like it just helps me just to kind of unwind. And that's what I, I, I wish for a special um, needs parents that, you know, you don't have to take a lot of time just to give yourself five minutes to breathe. Even if you can do that, that would help you so much. And your child needs you. You know, your family needs you. You can't pour from an empty cup. Um, and like I said, it took a while for me to to get here and realize that. So um, I didn't share this before. My daughter is in the hospital. So I've been working to, you know, just do a lot of physical activity and, you know, just to clear my head and it's been working. So just moving more, just yeah, taking your time. And it has helped me to have a clear head to really get on these doctors, because if I didn't, you know, advocate, if you didn't, you know, insist on certain things, um, she'd be home and probably have to take her back. So she's not leaving until we figure out what's going on with her. And so, um, And I'm able to be here and I'm so happy that I was able to keep this appointment because I would have canceled it, but I'm glad, (laughs) you know, I've I've taken the steps to have that self-care and to really um, navigate through it all. So I think it does help to just walk away. Um, I think that we have a tendency to um, dive deeper and sometimes into uh, work because it helps distract us. But I think that it's really not helpful at all. And so walking away. And so one thing that I like to do instead of like, what do I do for self-care? Uh, there's a lot of stuff that I don't do. And that's mm-hmm. for my self-care as well. Well, So mm-hmm. the things that I don't do, I don't wash my kids' laundry. And if mm-hmm. I don't feel like cooking, I don't cook. You know, my kids are old enough to where I can't, I don't have to wash their clothes. They're, you know, they've been taught. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm you know, help with the chores they do, you know, they do a lot of things. And, you know, I feel like not doing something is just as valuable as doing something. So, um, you know, that gives us a lot of space because, you know, we're always trying to do everything. So Marion, you don't have to do all the things. (laughs) Oh, I'm, I'm realizing that now I'm, I, um, I have delayed laundry. It it got done, but I did delay it. (laughs) It's not on the schedule. (laughs) Right. Only the must have. Yes. Get done. Right. Yes. <laughs> and then even for I my, know the kids, yeah. 
Yeah, so go ahead. Business, I have a list on my whiteboard over there that says that, stop that. doing. And these are the things that I don't want to do anymore and that I'm slowly delegating to other people. And, mm-hmm. you know, that helps me as well because I feel like, oh, goodness, at least that is off my plate and I don't have to worry about it anymore. You know? Right. Yeah. And and just accepting help. Like some friends was like, can we make food for you? Usually I say, no, I don't want to chop you. I'm like, if you want to, yes. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I think that's well, why I appreciate it because that. we we always want to like, no, I'm super mom. I can do all the things. I can do everything. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Just taking the help when, when it's offered is, um, it's hard sometimes. So I get it. Yeah. 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 All right. So um, again, tell us where everybody can find you on social or even on your website. Right. On Instagram, you can follow me at you are advocate worthy on Facebook. Same name. You are advocate worthy um, to book a free consultation. We call it the clarity call um, where I get to listen to your concerns and we come up with a personal personalized plan to fit your needs and your child's. Um, you can reach me. Um, you can schedule some time at www.youareadvocateworthy.com. Perfect. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you. And, you know, I hope your daughter gets better soon. Thank you. Thank you. And there you have it. I want to encourage you to remember that being a mom who runs her own business is not easy. We all struggle, but just keep moving forward and don't forget to make time for yourself. As moms, we are usually the first thing to go to the bottom of the list. If your business is overwhelming you and you need real solutions, not just some sugar-coated suggestions, apply to work with me at ritasuzanne.com slash apply.